Hey guys, Mike here. So today we're getting to answer all your questions and highlight some comments you guys put in there from this past week, which were really good. Uh, and so we'll talk about that and stuff. And so, I mean, you guys asked about a lot of stuff, call sweeps, which we'll go into, uh, crypto, which I don't normally talk about, but I'll talk about in this one, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So as usual, let's get right into it and feel free to participate by answering some of these questions as well and putting more comments and asking more questions. I always love it. And the first one comes with Brock here and he says, Mike, can you explain sweeps in one of your future videos or give me a link? And he's talking about call sweeps, right? So these are something you see a lot on Tesla, NVIDIA, everything like that, and it really helps drive stocks up. The, the big thing I know about sweeps here, right? So what happens here on the sweeps is a trader will instruct their broker, right, to fill its order at the best price possible, sweeping all liquidity on the market, right? And so typically these large orders can be broken up into smaller orders across multiple exchanges to quickly fill the orders. And the key thing about sweeps is the number one word to look at here is urgency. Like they expect something to happen. They're expecting a directional move somewhere. And what you're looking for is the big sweeps, not some small ones. If you, small, if you see like Tesla, for example, when it moves really big, you see millions of call sweeps flooding in. And what this is happening is, remember, market makers are the ones selling these uh, calls and stuff like that to them. So they have to hedge by normally buying the stock, right? If things get too out of whack right there. And so that's why you'll see Tesla move like that. NVIDIA, you saw it all week long, just call sweeps galore. But you need to understand between a sweep and a block because you'll see blocks way more than sweeps a lot of times, right? So sweep is a much more aggressive uh, call order. And then a block is where they're negotiating what's happening. Not in a hurry. They're not, they're not really seeing it's going to be a directional change. There's no urgency to it. So that's why people pay attention to those big sweeps coming out from the wells, right? And you'll see this. I saw I showed you one in the queues uh, a while back, and that guy made like $10 million in a matter of like 24 hours. Now, uh, next one comes from Bill here, and he says, Bitcoin, I've never bought personally, kept what I know and understand, but have been doing a little research. Long-term charts always show a dip before having which is what's starting now, I believe, should see 35,000, 32,000 for April is the halving. Then next 12 to 18 months is next bull run. You think with the new ETFs adding liquidity that we will see explosive run-ups or will it get suppressed thinking of throwing a few chips in on the gamble if it hits $35,000? You know, looking at the charts and stuff, obviously we just hit a major support around 38 right there and it got a nice bounce, uh, which we expected and stuff. Uh, the halvings over there in April, like you said, really good support around 32,000. So it could be anywhere in that range. And normally, yeah, you do you do see a sell down and stuff, as you can see right here. And so you can kind of see your supports and everything like that. And another thing when you're looking at this is really looking at the channel it's in right now, right? It's sitting right here. In this channel, it's been there since I think November of 2022, and it's just sitting right there at that midline right there. Got the 200 moving average way down there, and so you know, looking at that channel, anywhere from 32 to 42, somewhere in that range, people seem to be accumulating, of course, and it got to bounce where we thought it would bounce, where that would hold. Well, we're gonna have to see if that holds or not. But when it comes to the ETFs, here's a, here's a real answer: nobody knows. Let's be real about it. And I've said this before: like you got something that's supposed to be decentralized, governments aren't supposed to be really regulating, and here we are with the SEC. Right there, you know, the good thing about them going with ETFs now and approving them and the ETFs like a black rock on them getting involved and buying the actual asset. Bitcoin's here to stay. Right. That's just the way it is. So that's one good thing. But the SEC getting involved on it is a whole different thing. I don't I don't know. I, I can't. For me, when I look at it, I cannot imagine these cycles are going to be the normal cycles we've been used to. Right. With these all these ETFs getting involved, because if you're an ETF person, you're basically attracting people that don't want to have a Coinbase account or wherever and go buy the crypto and have a cold storage wallet and really learn all that stuff. They just want exposure, right? Because they've seen it. But do they want their e because and it's based off of the price of Bitcoin. If Bitcoin crashes like it normally does, right? And goes down, let's say 50%. Well, guess what happened to the ETF price? It's going to crash down too, right? You've seen like a MSTR, Mr. I believe it is. What happens is it's price, right? And so, you know, looking at that, or ETF holders going to be happy with that? They're going to freak out because they're not used to it. They're like, oh my good, whoa, what's going on here, right? Especially depending on how late in the game you are, if you're getting in your 50s and 60s, you really aren't going to want that. So that, that's the thing. Is it going to be allowed to drop like it has? Is it going to be allowed to rise? When it comes to the price, though, it, it, you know, this is my big theory now. Is, look, it, the market is what whatever it's willing to pay, that's what it's going to get to. You see all these things saying, oh, you know, it's going to go to 500000 a million one day. Maybe it will. Right. Maybe it will. But the question is, is the market willing to pay that? If they are, that's what it's going to. Right. Maybe it goes down to 16,000 because that's all the market's willing to pay. 
right? And one thing on crypto we still know is it's heavily manipulated by some large holders. That's still happening. Like people can play like it's not, but it, it is, right? It gets less and less as more uh, buy into it. That's the other thing is will these wells be able to manipulate like it has in the past if the if BlackRock and all these other large firms own so much of it, right? That's another thing we got to look at. So, you know, nobody really knows. I think you have to give it a, a year to kind of play out. We're going to see how the cycle works. That's what we're going to see. And we'll see if we get that big crash at the end like it always happens. That's what we got to find out and stuff. So, you know, let me know in the comments what you're doing, what you think about that. Now, and guys, before we continue, if you could hit that like button for me, I sure would appreciate it. It helps people find this video and everything. And also, if you like the content, think about subscribing, guys. Next one comes from T. Wood, and he says, You pointed out something at the 1650 mark speaking on the dollar going down while also coming from overseas, which could influence how earnings move forward or perceive. Could you please elaborate on what you mean? And I was talking about the dollar getting weaker. And what this means is for the mega caps like Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, all the rest of these, right? So you can see right here, the dollar rise and fall have a direct effect on Apple earnings, which ultimately drives share price. When the dollar strengthens, sales of iPhones abroad are worth less in American currency, hurting profits sooner rather than later, knocking down the share price, okay? Now, look at how this affects the consumer, which is us. So a falling dollar diminishes its purchasing power internationally, and that eventually translates to the consumer level. For example, a weak dollar increases cost to import oil, causing oil prices to rise. This means a dollar buys less gas, and that pinches many consumers. While that scenario is unfortunate, investors can have their revenge, so to speak, by investing in stocks of U.S. multinational corporations, which earn a significant portion of their earnings from overseas. And here's a good example. Let's say a U.S. company does a lot of business in Europe and the euro is strong against the dollar. The company's profits from Europe will be denominated in euros. And when those euros are converted against a weak dollar, there are more dollars for the American company and a nice jolt to the bottom line. Better profit margins usually translate to better results for shareholders, obviously. And so that's what this is all about. As the dollar has gotten weaker... They're going to be able to convert those dollars from, you know, England and Japan and China, all that back into the American dollars. And they're going to just get to keep more. OK, and the, and the exact opposite happens when the dollar is really strong, which was what, a year, year and a half ago. They were able to keep less. OK, and so it should help both of them. Now, as far as like local companies, obviously don't do a lot of you know business overseas. Doesn't affect them one bit on that part of it. Right. As far as converting and everything. And so just kind of keep that in mind. Hopefully that helps, by the way. Now, next one says, can you cover how to find a fair value gap? And yes, I will on this. I think I've talked about this in a while, but this will change your life if you understand what fair value gaps are and stuff. I encourage you to learn these. And they're not hard to find or anything like that. But when you look, I'm going to cover in video because you can see some right here. The higher the time frame, the more powerful the fair value gap is. All a fair value gap is is an imbalance between buyers and sellers. Okay, It is a three candlestick pattern here, right? And what you're looking for is that middle candlestick. See the red one? Is its body covered up by the wick and body of the candle to the left, to the right, or both, right? So that is not a fair value gap. That red one is not a fair value gap, right? But you come up here, look at that. That is a fair value gap. Why? Do you see the candle on the left or right? One, one there is not one, right? These are created when there's a move, quick move up, right? And that means it creates an imbalance. And so there is no count to the left or right of that one to cover up its body. You see that one right there. That one is not a fair value gap because why? It's covered up to the, by the candle on the left. And if you want to include the right one, you can too. But then right below it, that is a fair value gap. Why? Because there's not a candle covering up the body to the left or the right of it. Okay? So it's not a complicated thing. Don't make it complicated. Okay? So this is a fair value gap. The one right above is a fair value gap. It's created, especially in NVIDIA, because it, go it goes on these parabolic runs. Okay, so if you pull up the daily, the hourly, you'll see a whole bunch of these, right? The importance of these right here is that this is how the market moves. When it's looking for liquidity, it's looking for these imbalances, okay? And it will mitigate these imbalances. See right there, how it came back down? That is a fair value gap to the left right there. They got mitigated. That one right there, you see it? That's a fair value gap. Still hadn't been mitigated yet, right? It got left. Not all of them get mitigated, right? This one came down though, right? And it stopped, looked to the left, and it mitigated, which means basically the imbalance, right, has been corrected and it moved up. That's how the market looks for liquidity a lot of times, okay? So pay close attention to that. Sometimes if you, you know, are looking at a stock and all of a sudden it stopped, right? Why did it stop there? There's no moving averages, there's no support lines, and nothing like that. Well, 
pull up fair value gap. You can pull up an indicator too in trade view if you got it. Type in fair value gap. You have two different ones to choose from. You can click on either one right there. Play around with the settings. You can see I got mine where they extend out. So you can see those are fair value gaps, right? When it's mitigated, it'll show a shaded bar right there. But you'll see if you just pull this up and watch the market work on a one minute, two minute, five minute, 15 minute, you, you're going to see these, right? Pop up and get mitigated. And you'll see them. The, the market's just searching them out all day long, okay? And so it's a pretty cool thing to watch. So hopefully that helps. Let me know if you have any more questions on that. Now, the next one is there is something immoral about the idea that the Fed should be the prime mover of the market. And this actually started a really good conversation. So I actually just want to put it in here because I like these kind of conversations. And of course, it started a debate on, you know, whether or not it's a free market or not, right? Because, you know, my grace says, well, yeah, it's not a free market. You know, and somebody said, well, I disagree. You know, the Fed rates, uh, while opaque at times, is probably the least immoral thing about the markets. Middlemen driving your market order to specific corners of the markets. Uh, for some kickbacks, that'd be Robin Hood, and pretty much all of them do this, by the way. Not all of them. I won't say all of them, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's something else. Uh, you know, so the big question is, and this went on for a while, you see here, people kept going back and forth. You know, is it a free market or is it not a free market? I mean, put in the comments what you think. And I'm a firm believer. It, the only thing free about it is you get to choose whether you want to participate or not, but you are not anywhere near the driver's seat, right? And you can't be in the driver's seat. And the reason why it's it definitely is not a free market to me anymore, as far as, like I said, you can choose to participate, as far as the free part of it, no, because the Fed has way too much influence on the market now, right? Remember I told you, they took it over after 08. They were starting to kind of nibble at it before that, but after 08, it was all about the Fed. I mean, look at how many times these Fed meetings, how much sway these Fed meetings have. It's unbelievable. It used to not be that way, but, but now it is, right? I mean, when you become the biggest buyer of bonds and mortgage-backed securities for over a 10-year period, that affects the market greatly, right? That's why we went on that crazy bull run because of the Fed. Okay, so they have a huge, you know, saying in it, but also because, I mean, how can you have a, a great free market when you got BlackRock out there with nine trillion in assets that big, right? You have like three different companies that I think they make up like 17, 18 trillion in assets. Like there's, there's no way. And these guys can move whatever they want to move around, right? They have so much sway in the market. Okay, and so and yeah, and, and when you put your orders in and they're getting sold to somebody so the market makers can see and these, these firms can see what you're about to do and they can jump in front of you to make money like that. Yeah, I mean, that, that sucks, but at least we get to participate, I guess. Right. We got to be grateful for that. But as far as like being all super free is like, no, <laughs> no, nah, I don't I don't think so. And there's just many. We, we, and of course, you got to see this with the GameStop thing, right? Whether you in it or not, what they do, they screwed retail. They said, hey, sorry, all you can do is sell. You can't buy it no more. And just ended, ended it. Who, whose side did they take? Right? It wasn't retail. I mean, you can go, I think, in there a movie just came out about that again or something. So, you know, and there's been documentaries made about it. That kind of tells you, mm mm, not much free on that. Now, and the last one here has to do with a comment, I guess, a question on my take on the system last Saturday, right? Which I said, I think it's unfair in many different parts of the system. But this says, I don't agree with your take, Mike. So, is your problem with the tax system? When you say system is too ambiguous, please clarify. And this is when I was basically railing against a system, which I always have, right? Which I always start off by saying, I benefit from this system. I'm not saying I don't benefit from it. My wife does. Our families do. I'm sure a lot of you do. And that's great. That don't mean it's right. Okay. And because I come from both sides of the track, born on the, the wrong side, and now I'm over on this side, you know, uh, I kind of I understand. I can, I've seen the system on multiple different levels now and how, how it acts, right? Yeah, the tax system's a joke. Let me tell you a story. Here's a prime example I'm talking about when it comes to tax systems, tax breaks and stuff. Maybe this has happened to you. Maybe you can remember this. You remember when uh, President Trump was going to you know, pass this big tax cut bill, right? And when it first started off, it was called the middle class and something else in the title, right? And I thought, for the first time ever, ever the middle class is finally going to get their due. This is great, right? Because whenever tax breaks are passed throughout history now it, it basically proportionally goes to the bottom and to the top and the middle class are left holding the bag right you get you get little crumbs little crumbs and i'll never forget for the rest of my life going over to dinner at my brother's house he's a cop his wife's a teacher the all-american family right their father-in-law his father-in-law comes over great man love him to death super nice right has his own business very very well off man okay we're sitting there all of a sudden he you know we start talking about stuff and he brings up he goes oh man got a Got great news. Got a call from my accountant today. And he says, I can retire four years early now. Like he literally was going to retire like that day. He's like, I can retire now. Four years early. We had our, I said, what are you talking about? We had our plan. I had to work out to here. They had the numbers worked out. And he goes, no. 
President Trump just signed the tax bill. You're done. So he, he wasn't bringing in any more revenue from his company, right? Not getting some windfall of revenue. Nothing happened with the company. But he got, because the top got so much in tax breaks in that bill, he got to retire four years early. And I'll never forget looking at my brother and I said, are you getting to retire early too, you, you and your wife? And he's, he just laughed. We both laughed because we got crumbs. That's what we got. Got shafted once again, right? And so it's like what they're passing now with the increase the child tax credit and all this other stuff and all, all this stuff for you know tax break for these companies that have research and development. They're going to get billions, right, in tax breaks. But the middle class, we'll be sitting here. You'll be doing your taxes going, I, I'm not feeling that. Because, again, credits, all these deductions, they get phased out at a certain income level, and that's when you're in the middle class. You get it phased out. You're like, what? I spent how much on child care, and I don't get basically nothing? No, because your income's here. Great. You know, that's that's just how it is. You know, what else in that tax bill? Oh, if you own real estate in LLCs, you get a huge tax break. How many people own real estate in LLCs? I know I know I, I had a real I had a, a freaking um house that I was renting out, but it wasn't an LLC, so I didn't get the tax break. Right? And so that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. All I'm asking for, again, if if here's the crazy part, people think that these big conglomerates like the Metas and NVIDIAs and the Tesla like they're the they're the biggest employers. They're not. The biggest employers are the smaller companies because there's so many of them, right? And so what I'm saying is that these big conglomerates who own Washington are going to get all these tax breaks. How about giving it to the smaller companies, the family-owned businesses, right? The ones who's announcing layoffs right now, right? Mostly it's these big, the, the ones that are publicly traded because they have to do what? Keep the share shares going up, right? So Billy, you're doing Jimmy's job too now, or you're fired. Get going. We gotta raise this share price up, right? That's why you see, like I don't, I worked a family-owned business before in my life. Rarely didn't lay off. Even during hard times, they would hold out, right? Because there's just there's a loyalty there. They don't have shareholders to deal with, right? And so that's your biggest employers. Now those companies are being crushed. That's what's happening. They don't get those tax breaks that those big conglomerates get because they can't write checks to the politicians to bribe them to give it to them. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'll never apologize about that. And if you don't believe that or know that, you need to do some research. I have no hate for the rich, the poor, anybody, you know. But, yeah, I'm going to call something out when I see it. I'm not a fool, all right? I can go on for hours about the system, you know, but that's just the way it is. And, you know, that's just me. I don't. I make no apologies for it. And I think most people agree with my take on it. All I'm asking for is a fair system. That is it. That is it. I'm not asking for anybody to get, you know, have a, a have a have you know, some kind of special tax on the rich. I've never asked for that, not one single time. I asked for a minimum tax, though. You know, Warren Buffett, who's a great man, I think I've never railed against him, says it himself. He says it. He pays less percentage of taxes than his secretary. And, he, you know, he says it's a travesty. Well, I don't say that, but that's the system. I don't blame him. I don't blame Elon Musk. He's taking advantage of the system. It's totally legal. It's the system I rail on. Even though I benefit from it, I'm just one of those people. My moral compass says, eh, you know, it is what it is. If, if, but if I could fix it, if I had the power to fix it and come up with a solution, I would. That's the difference. I actually would do it. I just don't have the power, right? That's the way it is. And so, you know, we could talk solutions all day. I enjoy doing that. But the politicians have to be the one that pass those bills and stuff. So anyway, hope you got something out of it, guys. Appreciate it as always. Love reading the comments and stuff and the questions. And uh, please hit that like and subscribe button on your way out. And I will see you tomorrow for a big, big day in the market, okay? Or a big week in the market, excuse me. Have a good one.